أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله هو لا إكتوه يصل على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أقول والقات لما سبق ناس رحق بحق والحادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حقا قميدا ونظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ونظيم يا رب يا رب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to meet in the holy month of Ramadan and this month of Ramadan is totally different from when we're outside of Ramadan and these days that we're in presently are days that when they're gone they're totally different from the days outside of Ramadan so we are in days of, of Rahma, of mercy where all of the the gates of heaven are open and the, the gates of Jahannam are locked and Shaitan is locked so this is really a time when we, we can really get to know ourselves because now we can't blame the Shaitan and say Shaitan is bothering us and Shaitan is making us do this or he's whispering to us no it's just about us and our own ego and our own nafs everything that we do at this time is multiplied so even we should increase our salah in doing uh, sunnah salah, everything is increased. Uh, it's time to read more Quran and, and those who read the Quran in Arabic can try and make intention so they can finish it in Ramadan. If you if you take one juz a day, then in 30 days you can complete the whole Quran. Some people actually read two Qurans free in the Ramadan. This is, the, this, is, this is the month of the, of, of the Quran. So to try our best to read as much of the Quran as we can. So today, my talk is going to be on the differences of opinion in Islam. And how, even though there are many differences, we always have differences, but it's important for us to have unity. Unity, uh, and the best way for us to have unity is by having adab, akhlaq, when we uh, discuss or have any differences, we talk to each other with respect. This is a way where we can get around to many of the issues and problems that we face as the Ummah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and those who strive in our cause, we will certainly guide them to our paths. For truly Allah is with those who do right. This is in uh, 29 verse 69. So it's important for us that we are always striving for righteousness, to be righteous, to do good, and also to encourage others to do good. We should be known as the good doers, those who do good, encourage others to do good, and be with those that do good. And our aim is always for the pleasure of Allah. This should be our key focus for whatever we do. To always make that intention that this that I'm doing is for the pleasure of Allah and once we have that intention then alhamdulillah we have success as the first thing that everything is uh, based on is intention for example when we do our salah before we do our salah we make intention for the salah so it's good for us to have intention to gain the pleasure of Allah for whatever we do and also from this we can get the understanding that guidance comes from Allah. He is our guide. He is the one that guides us. There's no guidance without Allah's guidance. And He is the one that is guiding us. So we always turn back to Allah and know that guidance comes from Him. And when we're doing the right thing, we know that truly Allah is with us. And when we find ourselves in good places, in uh, when people do the reminders of, of Allah, where there's knowledge of Allah, where there's dhikr of Allah, alhamdulillah, we know that Allah is pleased with us. Because when Allah is pleased with us, He puts us in the best places. Alhamdulillah. Also in the Quran, it says, Nor should the believers all go forth together. If a contingent from every expedition remained behind, they could devote themselves to studies in religion 
and admonish the people when they return to them, that thus they may learn to guard themselves against evil. Is it nine verse one two two? So here we understand that the knowledge of Islam is very important. We're getting into a time where people they don't like to strive for knowledge of Islam. In, in education, we have a thing which is called lifelong learning. Okay, this is you hear it all the time in, uh, in education and talk about lifelong learning. But us as Muslims, that, that's what we need to be reflecting on ourselves. We should be on lifelong learning. We should be those that are continuously learning, always happy to uh, be at place of knowledge. When there's a circle of knowledge, you're there. This is the people that are, uh, are like people that are bathing next to a stream because they're always being cleansed. They're always uh, in reflection. Once someone finds themselves in a place where they're not learning, then this is a dangerous place. We find ourselves today where we have a large proportion of Muslims that don't have any no knowledge of Islam. And to have no knowledge of Islam, well, to have no knowledge of Islam is actually a very scary place. Because of course, with no knowledge of Islam, it becomes very easy to do the haram, to do the evil. If you don't know what is halal and what is haram, then it becomes very easy to do evil. And today we're finding ourselves in a time where people, they don't want to study about Islam, and so they're extremely ignorant about Islam. Even, for example, uh, my nine to five is uh, I'm a secondary school teacher, and I meet many young people, young Muslims, who have no knowledge of Islam. Even though they come from Muslim families, but they have no knowledge. And that is where it's very easy for you to be taken on to shaitan. Even when people, even when many people, so in this verse here, it says, even when many people were, thrive, were striving in the battles to defend the deen, it was clear that education and teaching is also of paramount importance. So even though people at that time were going out to defend the deen, uh, Allah was saying some people need to stay behind to look after the deen to be able to make sure that the deen carries on and to be able to give the message to others and to support others and to teach others. Because this knowledge, as I said, is lifelong and for us as Muslims, we need to be people of knowledge. Because the first word that was revealed is Iqra. It's the first word that was revealed for a purpose. Because we as Muslims need to be people of knowledge. We need to be people that are always striving to know more and never ever stop. Uh, uh, my grand Sheikh Sheikh Ibrahim, when he was growing up as a young person, what they used to say about him was that whenever he used to go, he was always reading, all of the time. Like he always had a book of him, all the time, constantly, constantly reading. And why? Because we know that knowledge is key, is paramount for us to keep striving, to keep striving. And also, Allah is endless. Allah has no end. We know Allah has no beginning and Allah has no end, but when you're striving in Allah, that knowledge is endless. It will never finish. It will never finish. So then, if that knowledge will never finish, then us, as we should always, continuously, throughout our life, be students of knowledge. It was, I was listening to uh, a lecture recently of uh, Sheikh Hamza, uh, may Allah bless him, and uh, he was saying that whenever he reads the Quran, even though he's, he's read it many times, whenever he reads the Quran, he gets shocked. He will read an ayah and he'll think to himself, oh, subhanAllah, did you see that? Did you see what Allah says here? SubhanAllah. Like as if that he'd never ever read that ayat before. And this is true 
uh, when you're striving in Allah's way. So Allah says to us that He shows us signs every day, but we never see the signs. Every day He's showing us signs, but if we're not looking, if we're not awake, if we're not focusing on those signs, we will not see those signs. So to be someone that learns the deen and also commands towards good is vital as a precious role in the sight of Allah. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Uthman bin Affan reported that our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. So the main goal of knowledge is to make the individual a better person. It's so, so important that anybody that talks about the deen, that they have to become a better person for themselves. Even for me, myself, when I'm sitting here, uh, I, I, I like doing these reminders because uh, when I do the reminders and when I'm preparing, uh, it's enjoyable for me because then I'm, I'm reflecting on myself. And I'm subhanAllah. Wow, Allah said that? MashaAllah. And we have to be people that are learning ourselves because we're on an endless journey. And there's no perfection. Our perfection is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is our perfection. Other than that, we are striving. And we constantly make mistakes. But the best of us are those that can make mistakes, know that they make mistakes, and then move on. That's the best of us. There was a time when... Uh, some leaders came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they wanted to uh, take the shahada, become Muslim and their whole village wanted to become Muslim, the whole village. And so uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there and Abu Bakr Allah, and Umar and Afan, they were both there. And then uh, the Prophet was asking who should they send? And then Abu Bakr mentioned one man and Umar mentioned another man. And so they started discussing, discussing, no, 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 we should send this man, we should send this one, and they were giving their reasons why, and it became into quite a debate, okay, between the, imagine there's, there's, there's a man in front of them, Rasulullah is in front of them, and they're having this discussion. Then it got quite heated. Then Allah SWT sent down Quran saying that when you're with Rasulullah sallam, don't raise your voice above the messenger's voice. Don't raise your voice above the, the voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, this was in Alhamdulillah, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Uthman bin Abad. These, these, are, these are Umar and Madallah an Abu Bakr Siddiq. These are the lovers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are our shining lights. And these are the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are the men that we can't even reach their level. And they were having a discussion, it's discussion. And in that discussion, it got heated and Allah brought down Quran saying, don't raise your voice amongst the messengers. And the interesting thing is, straight after that, they said that Umar, after that, he never used to, when he used to talk to the Rasulullah, he used to whisper. He used to be and Rasulullah said to him, Umar, I can't hear you. Come and raise your voice. I can't hear you. And, and his voice was like that throughout his life after that. When he talked to Rasulullah, he used to just whisper to And uh, because, why? Because Umar, he was someone that when he learned something, he would put it into practice immediately. He wouldn't put it into practice next week next month immediately alhamdulillah and you start practicing it and this is something we can reflect on when we learn something when we know something are we people that we try to bring it into our lives straight away or are we people that say inshallah maybe next year i can do that inshallah or are we people that when we learn something we know it's a sunnah do we try to implement it straight away when we gain knowledge, do we practice it straight away? Or are we people that say, inshallah, 
sometime in the future, so maybe next year. But that's something great about Umar, that whenever he learned something new, he would uh, do it straight away. There was another companion of Rasulullah who he had a deficiency, so he used to talk loud. And when this was revealed, even though it wasn't revealed for him, when he heard this, he'd stayed at his house. And he felt very sad. Oh my God, he said, every time I talk, I'm just loud. I'm always loud, but I can't help it. I'll just talk loud. So he stayed at home. He didn't come out. He was, he was at home. And then he talked, when well, the companion started, said, oh, where's so-and-so? Where? We haven't seen him for a long time. They had to go and find him. And when they found him, they said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard this ayat, and I was thinking that uh, I'm someone, that I, my voice is too loud, and I don't want to lose all of my deeds. So I just stayed at home. And then Rasulullah said, him, it's not for you, alhamdulillah, and he was happy. <laughs> Knowledge should benefit the teacher first. The best wisdom is Allah's words, which are found in the Quran. So, the difference of opinion in Islam, we're talking about uh, unity, creating unity. And it's interesting because like, uh, uh, creating love and unity, and it's interesting because like Sayyidina Bukha, he called the charity Ulfa, eh? Ulfa, having, Ulfa, having love. Creating Ulfa, so us, as a community, we should create ulfa, unity and peace. It's the greatest obligation to have community. That's why Rumi's, mashallah, Rumi's cave is more than uh, a community center, it's actually a community. And this is what Islam is, this is what Islam is about. It's about creating a community uh, of safety, a place of support, where people can support each other, can uh, love each other, help. This is um, what the whole of the deen is about. This is what, this is what Islam is really about. Creating unity and peace is the greatest obligation. It's more of an obligation than what you think is the right way of Salah. This was said by Ibn Taymiyyah. An example of that, uh, when I read that, I was thinking an example of that is like, Sheikh Babika, may Allah bless him. Okay, we know that, okay, Fiqh, uh, he's a Malaki, he's a Malaki, Fiqh. So if you travel to Malaki country, if you go to like Sudan, if you go to like uh, Senegal, if you go to Nigeria, the Malaki, you see, they pray with their hands by their son. Allah Akbar, pray like this, okay? Now, uh, but we see, if you go to like, for example, you go to Juma, uh, in Cripplewood Mosque, the majority of them, they're Hanafi, because the, 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 the Asia subcontinent, Majority of Hanafi. Hanafis, they pray with their arms, it's just below the navel. And so, Shaykh Abu Kiyo prayed like that, Allah Akbar. He prayed like this. Even though he's a Maliki. And Malikis, they pray like this. But Alhamdulillah, he pray like this. And what happens? It, does, it just brings kind of like unity. Yeah? And not only that, this is even a higher wisdom. It's a higher hikmah. That if you know that uh, people pray a different way. Why do you want to go and be the soldier? Now I'm going to, I'm going to teach them. Wallahi, let them, I'm going to show them how to pray. Well, I don't know how to pray. I'll show them. Oh, Lord, wait, what? Let somebody come to me, let me, I'll teach them. Why are, you, why are you doing that? Who told you to become a soldier in the prayer? Behave yourself and stand by and just look at what everybody's doing and just fit in, alhamdulillah, there's no problem. There's no argumentation. Or sometimes you get the brothers that they say, okay, feet to feet. And because a brother doesn't put the feet, you want to kind of like stretch. Stretch your foot, stretch your foot, stretch, stretch. No, they keep moving it, they keep moving it. No, gotta keep stretching. And you're nearly doing the splits. Who told you to do the splits? <laughs> and there's a lot. Did Allah say to you that you have to do the splits in the Salah? There's no way in the Salah to say that. Since you just put your feet together. If a brother moves his feet, see, with knowledge, you will understand that there's different understandings in the Salah. If someone has a little space, you leave them and you say, Alhamdulillah. And you pray. Even I've heard some terrible stories, stuff from Allah. The uh, some sisters, they, they went to a mosque to pray. And uh, while they were praying, 
Some sisters took it like a hijab and just threw it over them. La hawla la qadr. Like to say, no, no, no. Uh, this dress you're wearing is not good enough. So uh, let me teach you. In the middle of their salah, they just took a cloth and then threw it over their heads. But, and what adab is this? What adab? Who is the judge? Who is our judge? Allah didn't say that he's going to make some of us be the judges of ours. He said, no, you look after yourself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that if we looked after ourselves alone, then we'd have no time to look anywhere else. Because even ourselves, we're a full-time job. Just looking after ourselves. Another hadith of our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, you will never enter Jannah until you become a mu'min. You will never be believers unless you love each other. It's important for us to have love for each other, to support each other, to love each other. We cannot be enemies of each other because we have differences of opinion. We have to learn to understand. It can be difficult sometimes if you have someone who loves to argue. Now this is, this is one of the, 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 the diseases of the heart. There are some people that they love to argue one and they always think that they're right. And, and any argument they have, they want to have the last say. Well, then I'm going to say this. Well, they always want to have the last say. And they want to argue all of the time. Which actually, this is from the shaitan, it's from the nafs. This is really, really bad. It's important that we understand that our deen of Islam is not a simple religion. It has many different things. It's very complex. We have different points of view. We have different cultures. We have different, uh, around the world, even the way people dress is different. And uh, around the world, there's differences in the way people practice things. But it's all beautiful for the deen. It's all beautiful. So, but where does this difference come from? What causes the differences? Well, there's many factors. Some of them, for example, the hadith criteria. So there's different hadiths. Or had they adopt different criteria of classifying <coughs> hadith. For example, Iman Shafi didn't take narrations from people who used to eat while walking as he did not consider them as a characteristic of a just person. So if someone was eating, they would say, no, we can't take hadith from that person because when, if the person is eating on the road, that means that they're not thinking about the other people that don't have. So they won't take hadith from him. Adoptions of usul, Scholars differ on the source they adopted. Imam Malik regarded the consensus of the people of Medina as indication of the Prophet's Sunnah. Other scholars like Abu Hanifa and Ahmad bin Afan did not. So for Imam Malik, he was someone that he would look at the people of Medina. Because the people of Medina are the people of Rasulullah And the majority of the Sahaba were there. And that, that is why uh, the Maliki thing is known as this is the thick of the people of Medina because he would just look and say you know uh, the companions are here and he would look at their actions and say this, these are the actions of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but uh, some of the other uh, schools they, they were outside of Medina so they had different ways of making their rulings and also interpretation some take literal, some metaphorical. Like an example of the Asa prayer, a difference can occur depending on the meaning taken from a word. I heard one tap say recently of uh, one us, and we know many people say, I swear by the time. Man is in a state of loss. But then, one of the, the tapses that I heard, uh, I think it was Sheikh Yaqub actually was talking about this, and he was saying that while us, by the time, this is the, it's not any time that they're talking about. This is the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walked on the earth. SubhanAllah. Because the time that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walked on the earth is different from all other time. This is the best time on earth. The best time on earth is when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks. Because we know he was the, the best of the the prophets, the seal of the prophets, the last of the prophets, and his time was the best time. 
So when they say one us, by the time, he said by the time, the time of Rasulullah was the best time of creation. And if you lived in that time, you was the luckiest. That is why, for example, uh, the Sahaba of Rasulullah are on a maqam on their own that you can't reach. Why? Because they were the ones who used to sit in the company of Rasulullah They would walk with Rasulullah They would look at the full moon. And uh, us, we're the ones who came later that uh, we didn't see him, but we love him. But the companions, they're the ones who loved him and saw him and looked at him. One lecture I was listening to by Dr. Umar Abdullah. In one lecture, he was talking about the importance, again, of community. That we have to be able to live together, we have to be able to work together, we have to be able to grow together. This means we have to understand that we are not all the same. We have different cultures, but also to understand that it's okay to have differences. But we must be able to respect the differences. For example, in traditional Sunni Islam, we have our great Imams, Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Humble, we have our great Imams who took their whole life just to study the Deen of Islam. Their whole life was just to study the Deen of Islam. And they had many differences of opinion. They differed on many things, but in their disagreement, they disagreed with adab, with, with love and with the best words. And they really loved each other. Imam Shafi, he once said, I never once argued with an opponent except that I may do it to Allah to show me the truth on his lips. Allahu Akbar. Which kind of person does that? They're having a debate and they're thinking, please make the truth come on my opponent. Who thinks like this? But the majority of people, they just want to be right. They, they, they want to show people, they want to teach people. They want to be the ones. But you can see the humility that Imam Shafi, he's not thinking about him giving you the truth. He just wants everyone to know the truth. Whoever says the truth, alhamdulillah. This is um, true sincerity. He went on to add that we are a religion of continuity, meaning we have a history, we have a past, a beautiful past, a present, and a future. We learn from our past, and this allows us to survive and grow in the future. This goes back to the blessed Rasulullah We are a faith based on tradition. That is why we focus on the Quran and the Sunnah, but also the Sirah of our beloved Rasulullah but we are also the faith of all time. Allah states in the Quran that He has perfected the faith and the way to worship is Islam. So we, we have many challenges today that at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu they didn't have these challenges, but we need to work through and find the answers to deal with our challenges. For example, at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no social media. The social media is the, is the challenge of this time. So we need to find and make uh, ways to deal with the challenges that we face. They had materialism they had at that time, but not to the, to the extent that we have materialism now. And even as well, uh, they had more barakah in their time. They had, you know, subhanAllah, for us, we're always moving around, running around. Okay, but they had more barakah in their time. Like one day would last a long time for them. But for us, we are there very busy and we find it difficult to do fit in a little bits of worship. So we have to find ways to deal with our challenges. A non-Muslim who was studying Islam said, in every religion that I see, I see reform, it is to go forward, to lead, lead the tradition and go forward. But the Muslim community Reform is to go back to the traditions. That's why for us, we like to go back to the traditional scholars that go back to traditional scholars that have a silsila that goes back to 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So for us, this is very important. I remember we we're the only religion that has things like that, the hadith that is and the seerah that we know so much. There's so much knowledge about every single thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did, and no other faith has it like this. But this is something beautiful that we have in our religion. So we are people of tradition. But then with that tradition, we have to also, uh, we have scholars that take the knowledge from the past to use in the future. Because we have new challenges, we face new challenges in the future. So unity is having differences of opinion, but respecting the difference of opinion. When, if there's ever a time we have disagreements, it's important that when we talk to each other, we talk with the best language, that we don't upset each other, we don't abuse each other, we don't curse each other, oh, you know, your head is too big, that's why you can't understand me. No, we shouldn't be abusive of each other. We should talk with the best words. Also, we shouldn't shout at each other or call each other names. Our best example is our beloved Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran, it is part of the mercy of Allah that thou doest deal gently with them. Wert thou severe or harsh-hearted, they would have broken away from about them. So pass over their force and ask for Allah's forgiveness for them and consult them in affairs. Then when thou hast taken a decision, put your trust in Allah. For Allah loves those who put their trust in him. So we know that Rasulullah Allah made him soft. Allah made him soft so that the, the Muslims wouldn't run away. And what we see with his companions was a complete transformation. A complete transformation because when uh, Rasulullah met the Arabs, they were far from the deen. They were in deep jahiliya. And but what he had with them was a, a mountain of patience, a mountain of sabr, which allowed them to be with them and to transform them into great people. The Prophet of Islam is our example, and he was the most considerate one. Whether it be animals, women, children, orphans, enemy, fellow Muslim followers, elders, if anyone in society, for every one of them, the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, he was considerate. He would love the children and love the orphans. He would treat animals fairly. He would give women their rights. He would respect their elders. He would provide what people asked him. Therefore, he was considerate to everyone without any discrimination. That is the beloved Rasulullah Sallallahu Wasallam. Once he said, I stand up for prayer intending to make the Salah long. In the meantime, I hear the wailing of a baby. And because of that, I have to make the prayer short. Having an understanding that I don't want to make the recitation long. And so, the mother will be able to run back to her child. This is an example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam caring for others. So even in the Salah, when he, because he heard the baby crying, he's thinking of the mother, and he wants the mother to be back with her child. So there's many examples of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, showing us that difference of opinion is part of the mercy of Rahmah, the mercy of Islam. One of them, was once when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he witnessed the companions having a dispute, but did not rebuke them. The incident relates to a dispute regarding the Asa, Asa Salah. And the, the companions were on their way to Bani Khorasan. The Prophet instructed the companions to go and to fight. And he said to them, do not pray until you get to the Bani Kareza. On the route to Bani Kareza, the time of Asa was drawing close. And then a dispute started. One group understood that a Prophet's command, metaphorically thinking that a Prophet ﷺ meant hurry up. So a party of them, they stopped and they prayed. 
and another party of them carried on. So one stopped and prayed, the other party, they didn't, they went all the way, when they got to Bani Qurayta, then they prayed there. So when they got back to Rasulullah Sallallahu they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, we both heard you, and we both did different things, please explain to us who was right and who was wrong. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't say one of you was right and one of you was wrong. What he said, He said, one of them could have been right, but the Prophet Sallallahu did not point that out. He said, whoever performs ishtihad and ears will receive one reward. Whoever performs ishtihad and arrives at the correct answer will get double the reward. So both of the people who did different things, both of them will be rewarded. And we get an understanding that sometimes people make uh, the scholars have different understandings, but they both are rewarded. Even when we look at our, uh, our, our four different madhabs, they have different understanding on things, but all of them are fine. And they're all correct in their understanding. So if you pray with your hands folded, if you pray with your hands by your side, if you pray with your hands up here, alhamdulillah, they're all fine. As long as you're following one of the traditional scholars, alhamdulillah, they're all okay. Imam Ghazali, he said, the most learned amongst the people is also the one who is the most knowledgeable of the differences among the people. So to actually to understand the differences, to know that, okay, sometimes uh, after the Salah, some people, they say, Ami, loud, and some others, they, they, they say, very silently. That's to understand the differences. And the companions of Rasulullah went to different places. At the time of Imam Malik, the, the Khalifa of the time said to him when he created his book, the Mawata, Imam Malik, the first hadith collection, he said to him, I want to uh, make a gold one of the Mawata and I want to hang it on the Kaaba. And so this is going to be the, the, the guidance for all Muslims. And Muslims, they mustn't, you know, diverge or go away from this. And Imam Malik, from his, from his knowledge, said, no, don't do that. And they asked why. He said, because some of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu they left Medina. Some of them went to Iraq, Syria, they moved, they moved around. And all of them are holding treasures of Rasulullah Sallallahu So just to... Just say that uh, the Mawata is enough, then we're going to be getting away or missing a lot of the knowledge of Rasulullah So this is like a wisdom of Rasulullah, of uh, Imam Malik. In the Quran, Allah says, Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found therein much discrepancy. And also Allah says in the Quran, do they not ponder over the words of Allah? Or has anything come to them that did not come to their fathers of old? So it's important that we are people of ponder, of reflection, that we reflect. Another example from the history of Rasulullah two Sahabas were traveling and they wanted to pray and there was no water. So they made tayammum. So when there's no water, you can get tayammum. You get the, the earth and you can make tayammum. Okay. So, so that they made time and then they prayed. Then they carried on their journey. Later on, they found water. So one of the Sahaba said, oh, we've got water now. So then he uh, made water with the water and said, I'm going to pray. The other one said, there's no need. We, we time, I did time on and we prayed already. There's no need to pray again. But one said, no, I want to pray again. So I got water now. So, so there's two different things that happened there. Okay, but when they went back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, again he said to them that they, they, they told him what they did, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, "Oh, for the one who made the tayammum and then he didn't pray again, that's what I would have done. That's what I would have done." And then he said, "But to the one who um, uh, he, he made wudu after and then he prayed again, Alhamdulillah, he will be rewarded as well because 
That is like nor on top of nor, light on top of light. He did the right thing, and then for him praying again, there's nothing wrong with that. So alhamdulillah, again, Rasulullah he's teaching us that both of these are right. The difference of opinion, and both of them are right. And uh, another hadith of Rasulullah a person speaks a word, and oh, this is very nice hadith, this one. Very, very nice. I lie. It's one of those ones that, when I was reading, I was reflecting on this, and I was thinking, SubhanAllah. And this hadith here is so beautiful because it makes us think about our, our tongue, our mouth. Because, like, the most dangerous thing that we have is our tongue. Because even uh, sometimes it says, just some advice from Rasulullah is say a good word, and if you can't say anything good, just keep quiet. It's better for you. Well, like, just keep quiet. <clears throat> Sometimes Rasulullah Sallallahu he wouldn't even talk a lot. He'd just be quiet. And when he spoke, he'd just speak a few words. He wouldn't speak a lot, just a few words. But with those few words, the knowledge from them is, we can be studying them for, for, for days, for years. But a lot of times, just be quiet. But in today's society, like we, we like noise. We don't like quiet. We like noise. So even when we're at home by ourselves, the people, they put the TV on and there's no one in the house. So oh, I just like the sound. They just don't want to have that peace, that quiet. So it's interesting. But in, in this hadith, a person speaks a word which brings the pleasure of Allah he has no idea of where it will lead to. But Allah writes his pleasure till the day of judgment. So someone can say something that is so beautiful that Allah is so happy with what that person said that he writes the, the pleasure of it and then till the day of judgment. It's like basically you say a word, it can take you to Jannah. One word that you say that might have made somebody so happy, you might have done something, and to you, it's nothing. It, it might even be a good morning either to someone. But for you, it's normal, alhamdulillah. But Allah loved it so much, that one word, it takes you to Jannah. A person says a word, he says a word that earns, it's another person now, another person says a word, and that word earns the anger of Allah. And he doesn't think that it will come to anything, but because of it, Allah writes down his wrath till the day of judgment. SubhanAllah. So, a beautiful word can be so great, the reward can be so great, it can take us to Jannah. But then, a horrible word can take us to Jahannam. When we're reflecting on this, it makes us think that then we need to be people that reflect on our words. Because our words are things that can really hurt people. And our words are things that can really uh, bring people up. Words can raise self-esteem so high, but words can also bring self-esteem down. And it's always also, it's about thinking before we talk. This is the hikmah from this. That we think before we talk. It's like giving advice. The best advice to give to someone, you have to first of all think, would this advice benefit this person? Will it benefit this person? Or, if I say it, will it make this person worse? Will it cause a problem? If it's going to cause a problem, then it's not even worth saying it. That's one. Also, even advice has to be given in a certain way. So even if you wanted to give someone sincere advice, that advice has to be alone. That, that is the sunnah, so it has to be alone. So it's important that if we're going to say something, we should say a good word will be silent. Sa'i Mu'ad, companion of Prophet 
in the beginning of Islam, but okay, this is another idea about some things came in Islam which actually uh, the companions are themselves introduced to themselves. Some of the, the practices that we have in Islam came from the companions themselves. And this is one example. So, Sa'id Mu'ad, one of the companions of Rasulullah in the beginning of Islam, when he would join a prayer, so basically when the companions, when they used to join a prayer at the time of Rasulullah they would actually, they would say to the person, how much, like they would just nudge them, how much rakats have you done? And the person won't ask you because he's, he's in the Salah, but would just say, like, just say, okay. So you would know, okay, so they've done two. So and afterwards, they would pray two, and after they pray two, then they would join the Salah. And the reason why they would do that is so that when Rasulullah says, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, then he would turn around, everybody would be sitting down. No one would be standing up. So that was the idea. So you would quickly pray, and then you would join the Salah, and then you would finish when Rasulullah finishes. You wouldn't be, like for example, what we do today, we stand up. But, so Sayyid Ma'ad, he, um, he thought, actually, I want to get the full barakah of praying behind Rasulullah So then, what he did, he joined the Salah. And then when uh, Rasulullah said, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, As-salamu alaykum wa he stood up. So of course, when Rasulullah turned around, there's only one man standing up. Everyone else, of course, is sitting down, because this is the Adam. And he stood up, and he carried on his prayer. So Rasulullah was watching him while he prayed. And then when he finished, he asked him, you know, what, what happened? What was you doing? He said, I have a I, I came late, and I wanted to get the full barakah of praying behind you. So I joined the Salah, and then when you finished, I got up to carry on. And then Rasulullah he turned to the to all of the Sahabas and said, look, that we've learned something new from Mu'ad. Mu'ad has taught us something new and all of you should follow him in it. Showing us that something, uh, he initiated something from his love of Rasulullah and he also accepted it and said, all of you have learned something new, you should follow it. So the Prophet said, Mu'ad has initiated a sunnah for all of you to follow. So, and just finally to say to you, Imam Layf ibn Sa'ad was one of the great Imams of Fiqh. And he was around at the same time of Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa. And just to say that the, the, the Imams of Fiqh, there was many. There was, but we had many, many schools of thought. Now we have four, but there was many. There was even more than a hundred different schools of thought. But then this is Allah subhanahu Allah, He actually gave tawfiq for the four. Imagine. Because for, for those four to survive, when there's more than a hundred, that Allah subhanahu Allah allowed these four to be the chosen ones. But anyway, Imam, Imam Alayh ibn Sa'ad, he was one of the great scholars of fiqh of the time. Okay, and even Imam Malik, they all, they all respect to him. So, once Imam Malik, uh, he wrote a letter to him. This is the prophetic way, actually. The, 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 the companions and the tabi'een, they all, they used to write letters to each other. This is the way how they used to talk to each other. They're they beautiful, you know. So anyway, so once Imam Malik wrote him a letter saying, that he loved him, he respected him, he was a great scholar, he had, you know, great rulings. But then he said, he heard that he had said something different from, from his teachings. And he, he said, you know that uh, my teachings is from the people of Medina, and the people of Medina are known as the Sahabas, and the Sahabas, uh, this is the fiqh of Medina. The fiqh of Medina is what I found out. Okay? So this is what he said in the letter. And he said, why do you say something different? And then, Imam Layf, he wrote back to Imam Malik, and he said the same thing, that he loves him, he respects him, and that he was right about the fiqh of Medina, and everything that he said is correct. He said, Imam Malik, everything that you said is correct. 
But he said, even though everything that you said is correct, it doesn't mean I have to agree on everything that you say. It doesn't mean that we have to see eye to eye on everything. This is what he was saying to him. But then, he also said, may Allah take some years off my life and give it to you. So you can benefit the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at, look, look at this beautiful, look at this hikmah. Look at, look at how these two uh, companions, uh, uh, how these two Imams are talking to each other. Look at the love and respect. Okay, and, and even though they're having a disagreement, he's saying, but may Allah take some of my years for my life and put it onto your life because you are benefiting the Ummah of Rasulullah and, uh, you know, and we love you. So he's in acknowledging one, the ilm of Imam Malik, and secondly, he's saying that you are better than me, I don't need to agree with everything that you say. Uh, one of the sheikhs of Medina, uh, who, who uh, teaches at the Medina University, he was saying, yes, uh, many people say we need to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, the Quran and the Sunnah. It's true, we need to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, but even the Quran and the Sunnah needs to have an understanding. But this is the danger when you pick up a hadith and you just read it and you don't have the understanding of where this hadith comes from. So to give you an example, one hadith is that Rasulullah he said, whoever eats camel meat, you should go up and make wudu. So then people, when they read this, said, okay, so when they would eat camel meat, everybody would, okay, they would get up and they would go and make wudu. Okay? But the understanding of this hadith is deeper than that. It's because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Okay, I'll just quickly finish this. So quickly, um, Imam Where was that? Hmm? Yes, yeah, camel meat. Alhamdulillah. Exactly like the camel meat. So the camel meat. So uh, the the understanding behind this is that with the camel meat, is that Rasulullah he saw that in his group of Sahaba, he saw one of them didn't have wudu. He saw one of them was sitting in the jamaat and they didn't have wudu. He didn't want to embarrass that Sahaba and say to the Sahaba, "Can you go and make wudu?" So instead of saying that, he knew all of them together were eating camel meat. So he said, whoever's eating camel meat, go and make wudu. All of them got up, including the one that didn't have wudu, and they went to make wudu. So this is a, a, an example. Another, the last one, is that Rasulullah when, when it came and it says that you should raise your, you should raise your, feet, uh, your trousers above your ankles. But the meaning of this, is that because Abu Bakr Sadiq, who used to wear big clothes, but they used to drag, and Abu Bakr, and he said, even me, and Rasulullah said, no, it's not for you, Abu Bakr, because you don't wear it out of pride. Mm -hmm. And what does this mean? Because those days, the Arabs, to show their wealth, they used to wear uh, expensive clothes, but they used to make it drag. Mm -hmm. You know that when you see the queen, and the queen, she has a, a long robe, it's about nearly one mile long, and they're all carrying it, it's to show wealth. And it wasn't to do with actually lifting your trousers up, but it was actually to, to show, to do things not out of pride. Okay? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us something good. And in conclusion, just to say, there's difference of opinion. It's not a means to divide us as an ummah. It should be a reason to unify us. We should love and respect the difference of opinion. There will always be differences of opinion on matters that is perfectly fine. But it's important for us to learn a, 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 a madhab, stick to a madhab and learn it. And don't be people that say, oh, we don't need a madhab. Those of the, the scholars of the past, like Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, they spent their lifetime studying this. So it's important that we choose one and we learn it. And it will take you a lifetime even to learn one. Okay? So learn a madhab and stick to it. Knowledge is key, but it's beneficial, it needs to be practiced. Whatever we learn, we need to be people that practice it. If we don't practice it, it's no good for us. And actually, it can come on a day of judgment and it might be something that can take us to the hellfire if we're not practicing what we know. That's why Allah says, why do you say do what you don't do? When we talk to each other, use the best words. Talk to each other with adab, with nice words. The best of us are the ones 
who treat each other the best. If we ever want to give someone sincere advice, do it in private. And finally, our best example is definitely the beloved Messenger of Allah, the seal of all of the Prophets, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Akuli Kula Astaghfirullah Adima Tumu Ilayh, and if it's good, it's from Allah, and if it's bad, it's from my own nas. A'udhu Billahi Bila Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah, Ma'ani Wahim, Alhamdulillah, Bila Alameen, Rahman Ibrahim, Maliki, Madini, Yaakin, Abudu, Yaakin, Nista'in, Idina Surat, Mustafi, Surat, Alam, Wa Alimadu, Bila Alim, Wa Nata Alim, Ameen. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه اللهم صل على مصطفى وعلى اله وصحابه وسلم كثيرا ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وفي الدنيا ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله ولي الدين وان لله ولا اله راجعون يا الله we fast for you يا الله accept our fast يا الله help us to be people of knowledge يا الله help us to be people that put knowledge into practice Ya Allah, help us to be people, Allah, that love you, that love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Help us to be people that build communities. Ya Allah, we ask you Allah to support Rumi's came and to support Rumi's came and to be people Allah, that help others. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Akhulik khawri khada. Astaghfirullah, Dima Tubu, Ilayh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.